when we were putting together this conference, we thought, why not have a panel of experts assembled probably for the first time, talk about what's next for the software, talk about what's next for the people who are using it, to talk about what's next. So that's the point of this panel. So I've got a couple of questions that have been provided by Jonathan and the team. I'm going to start with some of those. I think it'd be interesting for the three of you who are not Jonathan. <laughs> what tool do you use when you decide not to use hype? And we'll, and we'll start with that. What tool do I use when I decide not to use hype? Um, that would depend entirely on what the deliverable is and what platform that deliverable needs to go on. And since Hype is an HTML5 tool, um, that might be something that I have to use After Effects for. It's primarily video. It's not requiring a lot of interaction and that sort of thing. Um, for me, I guess it's either one of two situations. If it's a coding thing, then I go back to text wrangler or some kind of ASCII editor if it's a uh, you know, pure JavaScript kind of problem and then um, probably <coughs> Illustrator or something like that if it's a different, more of a, an image kind of issue, so. Um, I would say for web stuff, I have made a ton of uh, hype websites lately. Um, I've been doing a lot of Squarespace for clients that need really simple, easy, non-animated websites, so I think that's probably the, the alternative that John, then this will be for you. So, what give uh, maybe your top one or two most interesting things that you've seen somebody do with Hype this past year? So, actually, uh, the first one that comes to mind is in fact uh, Gary's book on. Um, a chapter start animation that was done by Susan and Dean as well. I think um, for the iBook case, as I was going through the book, it was the type of thing that just really caught my attention um, when there was an animation just as a chapter start. And it was something that kind of refreshed me, got me excited about the chapter. So that's kind of a recent example, but that comes to mind. Um, there is another one that's interesting. It's kind of like abstract art. There's a guy named Big Papa E, that's his slam poetry name. And he, in his spare time, um, when he's upset or frustrated and not doing slam poetry, um, he will make animated GIFs. And they're very abstract art based. I would, I don't know what the right search term is, but you would look it up and you would not think that these shapes can go this direction. They're all looping. Um, so it's kind of like tessellations, but animated tessellations. Very interesting to see. So if you can look, his, his GIFs are definitely on the artwork level and just amazing to watch that I had no idea shapes could fit together and repeat in such a manner. Now I'm going to ask three of you the same question. So give me your top one or two things that you've seen somebody do in hype, whether you've done them or somebody else has done them. Jake, you're the closest, so you're going to start every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd say that um, every time that I have a new batch of students in my UI UX course. Um, watching them go through these different levels of discovery when they're using Hype for the first time and what's possible. Um, again, some of the game prototypes have really been some of the more amazing uh, complexities that have been utilized in, in Hype. Um, right now, though, uh, interestingly enough, um, I gave them this challenge to uh, research, design, and start prototyping. Right now, we're just going into the high fidelity prototype of an app that reminds someone to take <coughs> medications. So it's an RX reminder. And uh, some of the things that I see coming and how they are going to make some of their ideas actually pop using Hype, I think are going to be really interesting. Um, well, I had time to think then while he was answering, so I like being farther away. Um, of course, I've seen tons of amazing things on the forums 
Um, and I, I love what my students have done in modifying the games. But one thing that came to me, and it kind of just showed the link between hype and creativity. Um, I had a student in class, she was always excited about stuff, and then just before class, sometimes I show, play music or show YouTube videos, and I showed a YouTube video of kinetic typography made in After Effects. And I just showed it, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't part of the lesson plan or anything. Uh, and then the next week she comes up to me, uh, could you take a look at this and tell me what you think? And it was, she took the quote from Cool Hand Luke of, uh, what we have here is failure to communicate. And you know, did the kinetic typography where the letters come up and everything, and just, it wasn't an assignment, she just said, you know, I just had to create this. And uh, to me, again, there's tons of amazing things out there, but that was kind of a personal experience of, I didn't tell her to do this, she was just like, hey, look, look at what the cool thing I can create. If, if that's, I feel like I no longer have to teach her, I just have to coach her and push her along the right path she's already motivated. So that was kind of a special thing for me, so. Uh, for me, I think that a, a lot of the things that surprise me and, and are really awesome are those physics uh, games and things like what you showed this morning was really cool. The things that your students are making yeah. really neat. Um, and also, um, and I was trying to think of what it was that, that happened. Maybe it was in New York Times or something where they had a, uh, an infographic that someone had used hype for. And I remember it was a year ago. I was just like, <coughs> this is big, this is great, this is really cool. And, and sort of the, the beginning of my inspiration for doing the inter interactive infographics. So Jonathan, I'll, I'll start with you with this and then we can, it can work back down this way. But um, as we heard Anthony say, um, and as we've seen, you know, because we do training in iBooks Author, we always wait to talk about hype on the last day as well. And uh, <coughs> there's some people, they just hear hype and they're like, Nope. They're, it's just because they just don't think that they can do it. And uh, for whatever reason, um, you know, educators have, uh, like anybody, it's just, it's a new tool, they got to wait in on their own terms. So my question for you is, judging from what you've heard Anthony say and what you know to be true, how do you think uh, Tumult can help educators um, make that an easier bridge to cross moving forward? So for educators specifically, I think that there is um, kind of two main things. One is the tool as it is and how to make that more approachable. And so I think having, I, I think this conference has been great actually because now I have a lot more knowledge and insight into what people are doing in education. So I think actually um, helping bring those examples out with them front and center, even the videos from this conference I think would be extremely useful. So I think there's just education on people's success stories um, that I would just love to see more of put those on our website and then that can just say, hey, this is what people have done before. These are resources or examples. So I think that um, is good along with education on how those things were done. So I'd say that would be one thing. Uh, the other I think is to more comprehensively look at some of the use cases that have been done in the past and see, of course, it's kind of take that synthesis of feedback on what are the hard things that educators are doing to try to figure out if there are better workflows. I don't know if I have specific answers off the top of my head on that, but I think um, you know, always seeing more and more examples is the type of thing that gets my brain going on. But what hurdles are people running into, and that hopefully turns into features. Um, I, I guess I can really just piggyback on on saying that having uh, examples of what people have done with it and sort of showing behind the curtain uh, can really be the best way. I mean where to put that uh, for most people to see it, I think is really just the community sort of making that possible, uh, sharing the work that they've done and uh, sharing it through the website or through the forums. Uh, and you know, if you know someone in education or someone that you think could use just you know, spreading that word. Um, I guess I'll, I'll second. <laughs> second that as well. And I think uh, just to add maybe this whole idea of name recognition that um, you know, if you if you talk to someone in the general population, you say you photoshopped it. They know what that means. If you said I created this in hype, you get that pause and that question. You know, and, and I think if uh, the more people that have heard the term, yeah, you know, somehow that becomes a little more comfortable to use as opposed to is this some brand new thing? And there's you know, you know, what what happens when I Google this? What do I what do I find? 
just an idea, halfway off the top of my head. So. Okay. I'd say that um, being that I haven't updated the lynda.com title, and that's been something that's been weighing a lot on my mind lately, and just over the course of today, I'm really glad that I haven't gotten too far down that road uh, because watching some of the other presentations and talking to some of you today, um, it certainly has helped me see things from your perspective and some of you who have taken my course. So um, it's given me a lot of ideas today um, on some of the things that I want to approach in that course um, to do exactly that and bridge that gap. And hey, maybe we can make hype, you know, uh, we hyped it, <laughs> right? So one more question for the panel, and we'll open it up to questions. So if each of you, including you, Jonathan, at the end, what's, um, John, you can put your own spin on it for the three, what's your, what's the hardest thing uh, for you to, that you learned in hype? What was the hardest thing to learn? Well, again, uh, for me, I had a lot of flash baggage that I was bringing along with me. So, um, and my students always struggle with it too, and that is just kind of learning how the timelines work. It's not like some big radical concept, but just something as simple as understanding why the main timeline in every scene it automatically will start unless you tell it not to with an action, and then all of the sub uh, timelines or the timelines that are nested within. Um, don't automatically play, which is a, it's a good thing, but, but when you think about, you build, you're building a, a timeline, and you go back and you watch the scene, and you're like, why didn't it go? Yeah. And so that's always been kind of, that was initially one of the biggest kind of mental hurdles for me. It's a real simple thing, but for me, I think it had a lot to do with the baggage that I brought along being a Flash developer for so long, and that there were certain nuances along the way that I was, thinking I was applying a different workflow to a different piece of software. So that's for me. Uh, I guess for me, um, before this morning, it would have been responsive web design, this idea of pinning and, uh, and using those tools to accommodate different <coughs> websites. I had played around with it, and I would searched for tutorials, and I never quite found one that made sense for me. And then I was like, oh, I got plenty of other things to do, so I'll skip this part. Uh, but that was always kind of the big mystery box, and then after watching a couple of the presentations, I realized, ah, oh, this really is not that hard. It's just got to play around, you know. So that's probably the hardest thing for me. Um, Jonathan mentioned it earlier in one of his in his talk about how uh, the relative timelines are a thing that they don't talk about much anymore. Uh, they're really hard to really figure out. It, it, I don't think I understand them still. It's definitely. <laughs> nice plug. <laughs> well, I address it there. But right, no, but I mean, it, it all it all makes sense once it works. Exactly. But getting it to work, <clears throat> it's hard. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks for the feedback. Um, actually, it's really good to know what hurdles people have initially because many times they will either not get past it and then not use hype, or they will get past it and never give feedback on this was a hurdle and there could be users not taking advantage of the tool because they hit some sort of initial hurdle, so that's good to know. Um, I would say maybe um, one of the things I've been doing a little bit more, um, and I think this would be a slight hurdle in hype, but it's completely doable, is I've been doing a little bit of experiments with hand-drawn animation. So I've been learning a lot about just general animation principles and what Disney animators would do, things like that, that can really add a lot to animation. I think it's something that everyone should really learn, but I feel like there's not much exposure to those concepts in hype that people want to move a box from point A to point B, but don't realize if you moved it this way where you added a slight motion curve or changed the timing function slightly, that it would add so much to the animation. Um, so I think maybe that's a little bit more on the advanced, but it's also to get a great looking animation. Like I would love to see better ways to help people to kind of get these principles that have been around in animation for 100 years now um, and expose them because they really do apply to it. Questions for the panel? Yes, sir. So uh, I think it was Kathleen that mentioned, I think you mentioned Squarespace. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried integrating type animations into Squarespace design? Um, 
I can create videos to embed into Squarespace, but I haven't, I haven't tried uh, embedding the HTML5 code. Uh, has anyone done that? Yeah. And it's fine to work? <coughs> Perfect, yeah. Cool. I, I will promote that <laughs> as an option. Yes, ma'am. Um, we say yes, ma'am, right here. So. <laughs> yeah, the, um, uh, we were just talking about Rob something. I'm stuck on an animation right now in a car uh, showing how cars react on ice. And I have to show it steering which way you steer. And I'm having a hard time understanding the actual, like when you get in and make a custom menu that does that. That would be something that just I thought of would be really helpful. Because I, I keep doing it and you play with it for a while. But, and I love that it moves and shows you that it speeds up. <coughs> and it helps a lot. But when it gets more intricate and you're really trying to get something very specific on it, I get completely wrong. Yeah, so I think this is one area where motion does it really well. That motion's keyframe interface is also tied to the timing function, so you're kind of able to see both at the same time, whereas types is a little bit separate. That was an unfortunate implementation detail, um, but from trying to <coughs> nail that motion, I think you're absolutely right that that could be improved um, right there, because I think the more people can play around with the timing, I think the better animations generally will look. Granted, a lot of animations just should have the, the basics, but if you're really trying to get some good motion, yeah. then time function. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind the way it is now. I just need more instruction on how it works. <coughs> yes, sir. Uh, for, for me, being a complete newbie with type, uh, and with the question of how do you get educated to <coughs> use it, it just occurred to me, is there an iBook to teach me how to type? Uh, so the answer is yes, it's not one that we published. There is a book on the iBook store called <coughs> the book about hype. It was actually made by a user. Um, the book itself has some basics, but also goes um, pretty deep into, I think, like physics and JavaScript usage. It's a reflection <coughs> of that user and what he wanted, um, but there's a lot of details in that book. And there's a lot of hype animations in the book, which is also wonderful because you can embed it, and so that helps show Concepts. I think um, you know it's interesting because I'm not an educator. My mom was a teacher, so maybe it's also a question um, to people who are educators: What's the best way to learn? And I think everyone has different learning styles. So for us, I think at Tumble we decided, well, we need some official documentation, and I think we took the approach: videos is maybe the best way to demonstrate. But I don't think that's true for everyone and everyone's learning style. So I'd be <coughs> kind of reflect and, and say what are what might be the best approaches to teach this would be my kind of reflection comment maybe for Darren and Jake. Well also it's a marketing tool towards educators with my book. The other part of my suggestion. So what yeah so what do y'all um, well, I think video is great for the flipped classroom environment and for the self-motivated learner, that someone who is at, at home, they're going to do a Linda course, and they set up their goals to do you know a, so many hours per week. Um, I think um, for many, at least my students, forcing them to be in a certain classroom at a certain time every Monday from four to six, and I'm looking over them, you know, showing them what they do, and then you do it, kind of that uh, you know response um, that really works well for for students who are just starting off and a little unsure of how to proceed, I think. But. Well, I, <clears throat> I agree. Um, not everybody learns by watching videos. Um, and that's the kind of feedback I get with the students that I teach at the university. Um, I use Linda videos for, as more of a textbook type uh, situation in all of the classes I teach. There are certain titles that I assign uh, for them to watch outside of class. And then my in-class tutorials are based on those assignments. So they're getting multiple exposures on how to learn a particular piece of software, which works really, really well. Uh, because they come to me with these questions where maybe they didn't perceive the concept exactly or the workflow quite right or they missed a step. Um, and I usually then the in balancing that with the in-class tutorials makes for I think a really a solid learning experience. So we have time for one or two more questions, yes, sir. Um, speaking of video, and is there any is there a proper way to control a video time uh, time code inside of Hype? Mm -hmm. Like for example, if you want to make a video and no can kind of offset and make notations to it. Um, and then maybe keep playing and so the same way that you handle timelines with the time, uh, is that possible with, with a video that you use in class? So, 
So with the video, there's not really, the video kind of plays at a point you play it, and that's about all the built-in functionality. Uh, the good thing is that there's an API, like the video hype makes, it's just HTML5 video tab, so you can access all of that. And hype also has an API to control the timeline, so you can um, have the timeline go to any specific time, so you can kind of manually control and sync. I believe on the forums, there is some post of people, there's at least one post, and I think it's a pretty good post from someone who has a technique that synchronizes video and animation. Um, I think it's a really cool feature. But there's there's nothing built in right now. Um, but people have done it in the past. Last question, Kelly. Is there um, an education you have to be mindful of closed captioning for accessibility? If I put a video with height and I want to be able to have the student toggle captions on or off, is that possible? Or do they have to be open captions only and turn it on and then put it in? Um, so the captioning in HTML5 isn't something I know about. If anyone in the room actually does know more about it, that's good. But um, if captioning is done as an individual video track, and there's, I believe there's probably ways to turn that on or access that from the HTML5 video API. So there's no controls in height. Um, if I'd be interested in hearing more about that because that is something we could support. Accessibility is something I want to improve within Hype, so if that's a requirement, then that's um, something that can be added. I don't know much about it, so okay. I mean, I'm kind Th That's of something I can look into, yeah. yeah. Um, as far as if they're kind of out of band and it's really syncing something up to it, then um, the previous answer on there are some methods and forum posts would stand, but hopefully for closed captioning, that's a specific file format that's embedded in the video. And um, there's probably many ways to control it with some code, but maybe there's ways in the app that um, that's not necessary. To put it, um, a video with captions in either browser, there is one specific, there are all these transcript code files that fit in them, and I don't know if that's the most, most of them or understand what they're doing after that CD. But there's one that if you use that one and compress the compressor, it works in either Okay. Um, where you can toggle the captions on or off. Because sometimes there are places where they <coughs> want the video or the student doesn't want them. Um, but it's nice to be able to turn them on and off. And I'm, that's um, what I'd like to be able to do. OK, I can look into that. Um, the other thing is that because it's just a regular video, it might be that you can right click on the video and then choose subtitles at that point, or, or like control click. The video for iOS, clearly the paradigm is different. But on the desktop, you may be able to do that.